really describe what you're going to use to hold the burn and what you're going to use. Like equipment could be things like um, snap tanks, hose, ignition devices, whatever. Although that's mostly in the firing section. But it's or and so that's equipment that's required. And if it's aerial burn, you know, you talked about having the helicopter and the PST module and all that sort of thing. <coughs> and then organization. Yeah, again, and it, I think I've seen this where there's a default, um, what do you call it, organizational chart, which no one really uses. It's just, it has to be in there, uh, but you don't really have to use it. Uh, most of the time, that really comes into the IAP, where you start to build the actual organization. But it is, if you wanted to, the reason I don't, I don't really like this one, and I don't recommend that you put your organization together in that, is that um, there's a lot of fluidity. Like, obviously, we're going to burn boss, holding boss, and a firing boss, right? You can put that into the organization on the chart, but you're not going to put a name. Never put a name in a burn plan, okay? And they teach you that in the classes, but never put a name unless for some reason you only want this person and there's an actual reason. Um, because if that person can't come to the burn, you need, need to change it or you'll be in violation of your burn plan. Um, that's why we have IAPs is to make those little minor changes in the IAP. Okay, communication. This is a this is my opinion. I've always said this is that you should leave this blank, except for like maybe say the commander Peter. But I hate it when people put in like Nipsey Tech T one six eight dot two thousand, and that's my holding channel. Well, what? I mean, that's another one of those things. Like if you don't use Nipsey Tech two, you are in violation of your burn plan. It's one of those little nitpicky things that some fucking reviewer, you know, if you lose your burn, is going to give him like, oh, well, you weren't on one six eight two thousand. You guys are on R5 Tech 4, and someone might have read the burn plan, and someone was confused, and that's why you lost your burn. You know what I mean? So, what you should do, in my opinion, again, this is just Steven's opinion, is that you should put uh, to be determined, day of burn, whatever, because that's what you do for communication, right? That's what you do for channels. You ask dispatch in the morning, hey, can I have a channel? Command, we know what command is. Command's going to change, but, um, or command's not going to change. It's going to be the force repeater. But even that can change because, you know, like, look at us. We're changing our admin uh, channels here next week. So if you had admin net in your burn plan, you'd have to change your burn plan to update those. So remember, those things aren't, aren't uh, static. Yes? In that class, you were telling us that um, to clear that up, obviously you're not putting an actual frequency in there, but you're just saying you'll have, you will have a command, you will have a tactical channel for holding or and firing. And then that just clears it up right there. You just have those, and you just don't know what they are. Yeah, to be announced, to be determined. Right. Yeah. That's one of the big things they said in the burn plan was the wording, kind of keeping it open, but at the same time somewhat uh, on point. Yep, I agree. Held to that wording. We don't want the burn plan to fall it to a T, or else you're in violation. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and I've seen that change. I was going to say, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, was, I've seen that change of where it used to be real pretty rigid, and they used to teach that you should put your channels in and all that sort of thing and have it all detailed and I think people are realizing that it really kind of binds you a little bit. Um, if you put a holding and attack, then you have to make sure you have a holding and attack. I pers my personal preference is I like to have one channel unless things get real busy, so you can always put like there will be at least a, a holding and then a reserve channel you can use because then that keeps it free. And again, it's a nitpicky thing, but you know, you need to you know, we all want to be following our burn plan. Yeah, a lot of the word in there is saying it just, it'll be at the uh, burn boss's discretion. Yeah, anything like that, totally. That's where you have that kind of discretion, totally, to write that in the burn plan. Okay, element 13, any more? Uh, the medical plan is really just pulled from our golden hour plans, which you all will have those. We all have those emergency medical response plans. Um, so this actually used to be kind of a pain in the ass to write element 13, but now you should be able to just pull it right from your golden hour plan, uh, which gives you the distances to hospitals and uh, ambulances and all that sort of thing. And especially here, there's a lot of opportunities for that. Uh, this is where you locate your uh, coordinates for <coughs> uh, landing zones, yeah, things, telespots, uh, all that sort of thing. And that's something that should also, by the way, go into your IEP so people have that, or at least people should know where those spots are that we can guide in that if we needed to. So your ship, is it committed to that for the day then, however you choose, in your medical plan? Uh, no, it doesn't work like that because uh, it's not like a contingency resource. It's really just uh, an opportunity to land a helicopter if you had to order it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, it depends. I'm sorry, are you talking about a, a medical helicopter? Yeah, like, you know, on fires they assign ships to medical and then they can't do IA because of that or they may do right. something. 
So no, for a prescribed burn, I, I don't. I can't think of too many situations where you'd have a dedicated ship just for medical. You, you'd have one committed for like firing, and you can use it as a medical as an alternative. We can write that in. Um, a lot of that gets written into like an aviation safety plan or an aviation ignition plan. Yeah, whatever it's called. And on this thing, there's <coughs> something that we've been noticing, and it, we've been doing it. So I mean, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, but. There's very few burn plans out there or IEPs to go with the burn plan that actually list a burn center. We're out there burning. We shouldn't be listing burn centers. <coughs> isn't isn't the the forest, forest or district uh, medical plan uh, attached to the IEP? Doesn't that have it on there? Should if it's yeah, it should be there. I, I haven't seen one in, in our IEP. I want to say it does. I want to say it's the San Diego. I thought the burn center down there. Oh yeah, it's UCSD. UCSD. Yeah. Sharps, um, the I don't know if the new one was updated. The one I was looking at, uh, the new hospital there in Temecula Valley Parkway or, or yeah, whatever it is. Uh, uh, I know oh it yeah, San Diego was on there. It's something else. Yeah, I wonder if those see four. I thought that's a good question. It like might I, be something we missed. It was a side conversation we had about the burn center. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll look at that. That's something you should. It should be in there. Um, test fire is pretty generic. It's actually a standard language, spending us element 14 and, and 15. I, <laughs> I'm not going to name names, but I've seen some of our, my fellow chief officers write some old burn plans where the ignition plan was extremely detailed, and this is not what you want to do. You do not want to have like a unit map and be like, igniter 1 will be right here, and igniter 2 will be right here, igniter 3 will be right here. And, and don't laugh because I've seen that, all right? I've seen it where they'll, here's your strip and this and that. And I'm like, dude, that was one of the first things where I launched on that. Like, if you put it in your burn plan, you have to do it. That means you have no choice but to put your burner following those three lines, you know what I mean? And that might sound a little silly, but I mean, really, that, there's no reason. It should all be written, and this, anybody, anymore, every burn plan, it writes, Vague, like to to be determined at the discretion of the burn boss, in conjunction with the firing boss. That's the way we write the ignition plan. Unless, unless I always say this, unless there's a reason, you have to burn off from A to Z line for to achieve a certain, or there's some firing pattern through a certain area for resource or cultural protection or whatever that you have to do that with that. Where you should invest your energy in the ignition plan is, you know, if there's something where it absolutely has to be fired a certain way to achieve an objective. Make sense? So don't just dismiss the firing plan. Think about it. Are there some areas where we have to burn it a certain way? <coughs> That's why I say big and less necessary. Uh, the holding plan, it actually, not a lot, of, I haven't seen a lot of people really th spend a lot of time on the holding plan, but the holding plan should be like, where, how are you going to hold the fire? What's your plan? You can put laterals, you can have fire trucks, how many fire trucks? And then this is also where you have, um, you have to use the contain module for behave if you want to do that, or just look at how are you going to build an organization, under what conditions are you going to be able to hold it, where are you going to hold it, what are some of your options? And that delves right into the contingency plan. Which is standard now with our um, how we do our mop-up standards and our contingency and under what contingency levels, which I think is a Southern California standard. Um, but the contingency plan is simply how uh, you know if things start going a little sideways on us, how are we going to react to it? Well, how many contingency resources do we need? You know who are they going to be? And the contingency is something that I have a lot of arguments with folks about. Uh, so we can talk about contingency a little bit. Um, and there's a difference between contingency and wildfire declaration. Most people kind of forget that <clears throat> you can declare a contingency, right, and get those extra resources in to help you bring that burn under control before you have to declare a wildfire. And this is the big lesson from the cottonwood and why this is such a reinforced lesson for me. Um, because once, once you declare a wildfire, there's really no going back. But contingency, if you're, as long as you're operating under contingency, you're, you're fine, and you can bring it back to prescribed fire status. You know, maybe you need to bring a couple engines in, work a little bit later that day, bring it back, corral it, whatever, get back into it, and you're fine. Um, contingency resources, I don't want to talk about it too much, but the one thing that I really like to harp on is that the contingency resource, since you're not declaring a wildfire, you have to go back to the agreements. 
right? So a contingency resource has to be something that you can pay for if you ask for it. Can we pay for a CAL FIRE if they come? Or Alpine, you know, a Heartland engine? Can we pay for them? Out of WFHF, out of a project code? Mm -mm. Hmm? Yes. No. 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 The answer is a big hell no. No, you cannot pay for this. This is a very big deal. You cannot pay for them out of a project code. What we do is we sneak it because we know our agreement. Because we know that Cal Fire doesn't know the difference. Okay? If we were to call and be like, hey, can you guys help us out on a little fire we have? They're going to think it's a wildfire. And they're going to respond to it as a wildfire, by the way. And what's our agreement say about uh, crews, aircraft, and engines? First 24 free. For what? Wildfire. Fire spring. For what resources? Engines. For engines. engines. Yeah. What about for crews? No. No. What's, is a crew going to come to your burn? Yeah. Maybe. What about aircraft? What's an activity plan, right? No. You, aircraft is pay the minute you order. Period. Oh, I didn't know there was a... So you can... Yeah. It's only for engines. Yeah. So you could order an engine and you get 12 to 24 hours depending on your agreement. Hold on. But if you order Heartland or Myriad or one of them fuckers or then one of them engines, you're paying for it the minute you get there. And if you don't have and if you don't know your agreements and your policy well enough, you just screwed yourself because you're gonna have to declare a wildfire in order to get a P code which everybody and their mother can charge to. Okay, this is why I keep harping on contingency. Forest service is the only one for sure that we can pay, or BLM or whatever. A federal land management agency. It's the only one we can pay out of a project code, we can give them the code. Okay, so if you're gonna order, please just hold on. I see your hand. Let me finish my point. Uh, if you're gonna order those engines from Cal Fire, you better kick them loose as soon as they get there. It's fine to order them. I've come to a Zen moment with <laughs> contingency and Cal Fire. That okay, fine, order them, but you better damn well get rid of them as soon as possible and put them on a green. All right, what's your question? So when we bring that North Main stuff, and I, I wasn't making calls to Gary, was it? Dispatch somehow, I, I don't know, they were the ones who called me. I know, I'm aware. It was almost out of our hands, like, well, that's our job, we're going to do it. And it was five Cal Fire engines. And that's actually kind of interesting to learn because it oh. actually had to be the first service we have to have the Santa Jack or the Baldy because they were burning that day and so was the scan. So I think we had five burns going on on the forest. So there's no way we can call any of the other districts and we're pretty much depleting our own. Yeah. So, and I think it, the language is within an hour. So they're on the edge, the Baldy's on the edge from the Angeles. And, and so then, you know what I mean? That it's like you're kind of, and then how did all five mean? You know what I mean? Yeah, but then yeah, the dispatch is one going, oh, let me take care. Yeah, well, dispatch isn't the burn box. No, I understand that, but it, who has responsibility for arranging contingency? Have you dealt with dispatch but, lately? Burn box. They kind of think they're in charge. But what? It, it's okay, just remember to replace them with the green stuff. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's kind of what I'm talking about, too, because if... Per don't don't order cruise. Well, yeah, per, per, per the, uh, the contingency plan, I think the reason why they're doing that is because if you're going to declare a wildfire, ask you within that burn period anyways. Mm -hmm. So they're thinking that 24 hours is going to be free, is what they're thinking. No, you're not going to declare it. Yeah, that's in... Actually, that's yeah, us. he's correct it about that. Our, our, our uh, <laughs> element 18... that, it's funded. Burn. Or if it's outside of you have to. You have to. I yeah, see, well, I thought you had up to 24 hours to do Now, you right. have until the end of the next burn shift, yeah. which on the Cleveland is 2,000. It has to be. It's 2,000. It has to be but, controlled by the next Yeah, day. but yeah. say you lose it it's at 1,500 the first day, you have until 2,000 the next I day. I think so, yeah. 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 Right. That'd be more than 24 hours. Right. And again, I think some of the policies are actually 12 hours. I'm just, I can't remember. I can't quote that stuff. I should be able to. I can't. That's a will. It's not a must. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. So, so, film work. Yeah. The reason I said you can put it. Those stuff on a work code. You know, correct me if I'm wrong. You, were, I mean, I, I just heard the dialogue after the Cottonwood. Yeah. That there was funds to pay for <coughs> the aircraft that were on the fire. Correct. Um. What did they say? There was there was funds. Someone would have helped us out regionally if we would have made that phone call to that person in the yeah. beginning. So that's what I was basing my however my response. That's a hard one for me to choke on too because I was part of that. Yeah. I was holding, yeah. and for one, I seriously think we would have picked it up regardless. If we would have begged for any resources. Oh, yeah. um, on the other hand, is being any other burn boss 
Um, how would we have known to have that phone number to call that person in the region? We wouldn't have that that relationship to make that contact. But so you do remember but that whole remember incident that. with the? Oh yeah. There was the funds were available. So they said that, no, I, but I heard that's not for the region. But there's there's no mechanism for yeah. There's still no way to pay for the amount of project code. Right. Right. The we can pay. We can we pay like uh, Cal Fire the crews that come out. We pay for them with like a credit card. Where it gets billed. Yeah. Jerry writes a check. So that's a way yeah. we can't just write a check for you know twenty five hundred dollar an hour helicopter. But I have heard that about before you declare wildfire. The region has money set aside like in fuels. Yeah. Like yeah. a good chunk of money that they'll just pay them like instead of declaring wildfire and go through the whole investigation. Well that's what they said and, and but no one's ever given contact information of how how do you get a hold of that? If you person? go through your forest fire staff. Right. In yeah. this case right now you Call me, and I can get a hold of Rob. Be like, hey, I need twenty grand to bring the sand deck and all these guys in. Right. But that you got to remember that referred to paying for foresters and federal responders, not Cal Fire and all those guys. But and four helicopters was a little, a little crazy. But then you have to go to get. If we have to call to get the sand jack, I have to call this person. Have to order them. Yes. But then we have to go specific because you know the whole ordering thing goes. They're just going to order what type, the closest type. Well, yeah, we'll, send you. we'll sneak down and help you out. There needs to be a communication, <laughs> all right? And it, yeah. we don't need to turn this into we a dispatch bag. No, no, not, You're not, the not, burn not, boss. Not, not you not need to make... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, low as a hair. Um, it, it's really up to you as a burn boss to understand your policies which you're existing under, right? That's part of being a big boy or, or girl. Burn boss, understanding this stuff is part of the responsibilities of the position and understanding this. And if dispatch starts to go sideways, you turn them back the other way and get them in line because it's not their job to be the burn boss. It's our job to be the burn boss. Understand? Well, you can roll your eyes at it, but it's it's the truth. No, I'm not rolling my eyes. It's just you know, they just do that sometimes. <laughs> they just do that. They just go to the scene. <laughs> yes. Um, so if that did happen, uh, what what as a burn situation, uh, prescribed burn? I mean, would you have to? Does it fall on the burn boss? Yes. Because it's hand slap and you have to decide on how to write how it got out and yes. how you're paying for it and that kind of thing? No, it's, if you start getting into how to pay for stuff, conversations, you're, it's, it's so believe me, anything anything happens on a burn, on a burn, it goes a little bit sideways, you're going to have myself, Brian, Nobles, the Ranger, you're going to have all those people that are there to help you make a decision. But ultimately, it, is, it does go back to the burn boss. It comes down to what you're going to decide when you're standing on the burn, right. looking at it going sideways, and on the radio with dispatch. You need to have those slides to draw upon to be able to make the right decisions at the moment. Instead of being like, hold on fire, I need to make a phone call <laughs> yeah. to figure out what to do. Which is fine, and you should do that, but sometimes you just need to get the ball rolling. You have to understand... You know. No, but I, I'm wondering about the paperwork after everything's said and done. Who yeah. signs? Who, who is that? Is that the burn boss? Well, it depends on what happens after the oh. okay. Yeah, I think it depends on the outcome. So we don't need to get into hypotheticals. Okay. But you're never going to stand alone. Was there a question over there? Right. Going wrong. Going back. Sorry. Was that the funding part you were saying? Is that the policy that it can't come out of the UFHF? That's because it's just how the agreements are set up. Yeah, because of the agreements. Are yeah, there has to be a P code for in the inner in the CFMA agreement. I was just saying because you know that lady from the Sierra, the Ranger, she's like their big fuels used to be or something like that. She's uh, one Denise told me. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Denise. And she was. She, I guess maybe I didn't ask the question at the time, but um, they kind of made it sound that if you didn't declare it, you would be ultimately responsible out of your guys' fuels, money, whatever, to pay for whatever resources. So I didn't know that you couldn't. Uh, as far as I know, and I've asked this question for years and years and years. And I'll go for years. Yeah. Yep, because it's just the way the agreements are made. And that's why we had to actually do an amendment to the CFMA, which is how we pay Cal Fire and Cal Fire pays us. We had to do an amendment to be able to get the crews legally for prescribed fire because it's not none of that is covered under any prescribed fire. And if you're under the contingency, and that only covers crews, by the way, and it only covers ordering them through the proper channels before the burn. It's not an emergency hire sort of scenario. Um, because there was no provision in the CFMA to be able to pay for all the project funds. Makes sense to CFMA. So again, it's all an agreement saying that agreements are kind of boring and everything, but agreements are important too. So, all right. And then a wildfire declaration actually is updated. That's just, if you declare a wildfire, well, you get yourself a wildfire. So manage it. Put it out. And these are the last three, and then we'll take a break.
So I always love the contingency discussion. It's always a fun one. And I like to dispel myths. I mean, I feel very strongly about it. It's really not a big deal, but I don't really feel like people understand it correctly, and I want people to understand it. Understand. <coughs> this is why it just irritates me so much when I hear, like, yeah, you got two Myriad and you got two Orange County. Orange County, we start on the Orange County engine as contingency, because <laughs> that's a whole other thing. Like, All right, man. That's cool. I hope you don't lose it. You know, you have a history of it. All right, element 19, smoke management. So we write from the smoke management plan, monitoring. Do we need to talk about monitoring anymore? No. Do it. <laughs> You're writing a guidebook about it. I want to see better monitoring. And FEMOS. I like FEMOS, as you know. Um, and post burn activities, involved monitoring, rehab, anything you have to do after the burn. Which, of course, element 20 and 21, I hardly see anything in our burn plans about, but there should be more. And there will be more in the future. I know you talked about um, in the future, I don't know if there's going to be a, a force policy or not about doing like the bird watch report and the female reports and adding it in the final package. Yeah. And I know that was done, like some places do that simply for writing, a no, the updating that bird plan in the future. Mm -hmm. And they can read, okay, during that day, then weather, how, how everything went, like a synopsis, to better educate, have a better bird plan in the future potentially. I haven't made it a policy yet. I don't really have any way to enforce that anyway. It's just something I've been trying to beat the bandwagon about, about, hey, this would be a really good idea if we did. So at this point, we'll just keep it at that. So, all right, almost there with the required. Then there's five required appendices. There's maps, the technical review checklist, the complexity analysis itself, JHAs, and the fire behavior, fire behavior modeling documentation. These are five required. And I do want to point out, and it actually says it in the guide, for maps, you have to have a vicinity map and a unit map. You can have any other maps you want, but you have to have a vicinity and a unit map per policy. There's specifics that go with the maps too. It has to have like those five things in it. The name, the oh, date, like the, the stand or the Well, yeah, that's just map making policy, but yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so maps, should be an area map, also project map. So these are some pages that's in the prescribed fire guide that talk about technical review and where the checklists are. Um, I think 16 talks about the duties of the technical reviewer, which is that, you know, honestly, if you're going to do technical review, and what I've always done, I've tried to do anyway, is I try to go out to the burn site. So I did a technical review for the Angelus. I went up there, hung out with Dan for a day, and went and looked. I did a technical review for the Garner and the little Thomas Mountain one. I went and spent a day with Vogel and Dan on that as well. And as if you ever get asked to do a technical review, you should go, if you want to do a good job and be a professional, you should go out and tour the site and actually look at it. Don't just be like satisfactory, satisfactory, um, unless you know it or whatever already. Um, but you really should go and be a part of that process because if they lose that burn, they're sure as heck going to ask you as a technical reviewer, hey, are you sure you signed off on this, but this is obviously crap. Did you even look at it? Did you go out there and look? And, you know, it's not like you're going to lose your job about it, but, you know, do we want to avoid conversations like that? Yeah. Yes. You're like, I spent two days out on that burn, it looked solid to me, and then it just screwed it up. I don't know. That's what I want. Is that something you guys are looking at in the future to spread that out with some of the qualified RXB2s, like to do some of that? I would I would like to. Because like right now you said you're doing it, but so now you're the go-to guy for a lot of those people. And it seems like there's only a few go-to folks for that. I would actually like to see more people. Well, there's two things. I want to see more people preparing the burn plans before you start technically reviewing. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, if I can speak honestly, most of our type 2 burn bosses we're whipping through have not even written a burn plan. And then when I first got here, I proposed that we require them to write a burn plan, but we weren't writing their burn plans. So, sorry, but before you start technically reviewing a burn plan, yeah. you probably write one or five. And then from a purely program management level, the, one of the ways that I manage a program, or anybody manage a program, is to be the intake. And believe me, if I'm having a bunch of people doing the burn plan technical reviewers, that means I, as a forest program manager, aren't reviewing what's coming in. So it's a choke point, and it's a purposeful choke point that, for now, I'll probably keep um, for the technical reviews. If and people get tired, I that? agree 100%. Yeah. Because it's not until you're at the helm that you understand everything that's going on. And I haven't done any big burns, but going from being a burn boss <coughs> to trainee. Where you have the guy sitting over your shoulder going, hey, what about this? Oh, just do that. Okay. And then going from that to being the burn boss too, and people are going looking at you going, hey, what about this? And you're going, CMA, CF, uh, yeah. yeah. It, it, 
yeah, it needs to slow down a little bit, I think. I would agree with that. Yeah, and I've been able to make a lot of changes just because I've seen that. Been the but I mean, it, getting involved with the process from writing it to eventually technical agreement doesn't mean you can't be there. So like you said, look over the shoulder or at least do it, but have someone with you. Because that's some of the stuff, like this class, we don't get to see yeah. very much. And it's a, if you're an RSP2, technically you're a technical reviewer, no matter how much experience you have. Yeah. And you can be asked, and someone can say, yeah, well, if you've never done it or had someone experience to show you how to do it, how your process is, you're, you may miss a lot of things. So. so what I would recommend is if you see new burn plans being written, maybe ask to be part of the technical review process. But um, even, even in the right, well, the right <coughs> the district, I understand that. But like, Writing should be at the district, yeah. yeah. But the other thing is, too, is you can do technical reviews from other districts and other forests, or other districts on other forests. Um, I know that has happened a few times. Well, well, there's nothing saying, too, you can't just grab a burn plan that's already been made and then, like, try to rewrite it yourself to make your verbiage better yeah. for you, you know? Um, we're currently, <coughs> myself and Pro, we're doing four burn plans right now, mm -hmm. and uh, that's been kind of a, an eye-opener, too, in itself. Yeah. Especially because we can't find any of the old documentation that that existed before and either been thrown away because we do not have a fuels battalion anymore yeah. and his office has been kind of annexed <laughs> so there's no data so we're starting over again right and another thing that I, to, to back that up another thing I always throw out to everybody because this always comes up this time of year is that most people think that they have to wait for an actual burn plan to be written and then you ask to be a part of it I said just go pick a freaking hill yeah and write a burn plan. Yeah. And I've only had like one or two people that have actually done that. That's what I was telling Cole when he was, um, yeah. him and Jake were talking to us a couple weeks ago. It was a um, discussion on new project areas. You know, making more sense. Yeah. I'm sure you've been to some of the Chibuca ones. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, but another thing is in that class, you get the template for that. You can, I yeah. mean, I had to write a burn plan or help write a burn plan. I still have it on my geek set. The template's on there if you wanted to just mess around and make your own burn plan, a fake one. Yep. It's the whole same process. That's the whole thing. If you want to practice things, just practice them. Really yep. Absolutely. So, uh, I want to get to a break here. Uh, complexity analysis. Oh, uh, here's my disclaimer. As of a couple freaking years ago, and they're still working on redoing the complexity analysis. Because right now it sucks, basically. And it's really hard, and they're trying to make it easier. I don't know what it's going to look like, but it's been under review. And every few months, they're like, oh, it's about to come out. So, I don't know. You got the same experience? Yeah. Yeah, so hopefully it'll come out. Um, oh my god. Let's, you know what? Let's take a break and come back to this. Let's come back at like uh, 10, 12, 13, 14. Hey, no, I'm sorry. Sorry for the questions. Questions, questions. Yes. There you go. Um, that, you know, that's how you're supposed to do it. You're supposed to be very pure, very unbiased, very non objective about it. And you just kind of magically at the end, kind of you know, let the complexity analysis fairies do their work, and then you then you do your math and you say, oh, it's a, a moderate burn or it's a high burn or whatever. So that's the way they teach you to do it. But what actually ha happens most of the time is what you know what you want it to be going into, right? A lot of times for burn plan prepare, you know, well, I need this to be a type two burn plan, and you kind of. Have in your head, type, we've had type 2 burn plans in the past, they've looked like this, this is probably a type 2 burn plan. Type 2 burn plan, which is the burn boss type 2, is the most common um, burn. You know, a type 3 is really just a pile burn, although it doesn't have to be. It's all dependent upon the complexity. You can have a broadcast burn be type 3, and then, especially in the eastern part of the country, they have a lot of type 3 broadcast burns, because it's very, very non-challenging, and there aren't a lot of issues. Type 2 tends to be this large thing in the middle it's not too hard to get to be a type 2 burn boss but you know it, there is a little, enough of a challenge that you know there's some skill involved in getting there and then type 1 nobody ever wants to go there because it's like a chicken or egg thing where a type 1 burn is there's not too many type 1 burn bosses so why would you do why would you write a burn plan that you couldn't implement is, is what it comes down to a lot of times and because of that a lot of times sometimes you'll do the complexity analysis and you'll be like oh crap it's high and then you'll go back, oh, well, I can go back and mitigate that down, or I can change that answer, or whatever, so that it comes down to be a moderate burn plan. That happens a lot. That has happened a lot. Um, and there's some real reasons for doing that, you know, because, like, on our forestry, even now, we, like, we lost Carlton, and we have Tau. So I think Tau's our only type 1 burn, plant, burn boss. 
Tim Gray is almost signed off. Marinelli Jr. somehow got to be a type one burn boss trainee, and he's almost signed off, or he is signed off. Um, I'm, a, I'm a trainee. I think, there, I think Brian Rhodes might be a trainee as well. So there's a bunch of trainees, but not a lot of burn plans. So what we decided to do is that, you know what, we need to start being realistic about it a few years ago. So we actually went back and we redid the, uh, the Fry Creek burn plan because, you know, with Palomar Observatory, the school camps, um, smoke impacts, the potential for losing that burn and affecting the observatory, we determined, and we always kind of knew it was probably a Type 1 burn plan, we went back and changed it. And we said, to hell with it, we'll just get our trainings through, we'll, we have Type 1 burn losses, we can do it, it's a little more of a pain in the butt, but we're going to do it because this is the right thing to do and it's more defensible. And we did the same thing with uh, one of the Corte Madera burns that was right by the interstate, and um, Seems like there's an, oh, the horse thief burn. See, the horse thief burn is a type 1 burn out there, that fuel break, because of the proximity to have tool and the wilderness and all kinds of things. So there's actually three type 1 burns out there now. So, I mean, from a program point of view, what I wanted to do is I wanted to try to fix, instead of dealing with the issue and reacting to it, triage, I wanted to fix the issue, which is to go through a, a short, couple year painful period where it's hard to pull off these burns, but the result is at the end we're going to have type 1 burn bosses. That can actually pull, uh, you know, actually do these burns. And once you get a few, then you can start generating more. And so that's the process that the Cleveland is currently underway doing right now. If we end up getting to do this Fry Creek burn up um, that Tim wants to do, he may very well get signed off, and then we'll have a Type One on the district here, and then the Descanso will have a Type One, and it'll just kind of go from there. And the thing too to keep in mind is that if you get qualified as a Type One burn boss doing a type 2 burn will keep you qualified as a type 1 burn. It's one of those qualifications where it's, you can do a lower one and maintain the qualifications. And, uh, I believe. I have to double check that, but I'm almost positive. I, I'm almost positive because they know that type 1 burns are kind of rare. <coughs> and really the skill set is the same. It really just has to do with the nature of the burn itself. It, it's not like a type 1 incident commander versus a type 2 or type 3. It really is like the same burn, just the consequences can be more severe, which is you know, it's the complexity of it. So, um, that's a reason to take it higher, which means to take it to a higher level, is just dealing with it. But that's why you find a lot of forests where there aren't a lot of type ones, type one burn bosses, if they don't have a lot of type one burns. And then what ends up happening is those people retire, you lose the Carlton, all of a sudden you don't have any type one burn bosses, and all of a sudden those burn plans become type two burn plans. Make sense? So, okay. So how to do the math, there's four, okay, there's 14 elements, to consider their elements are, cons are categorized into three factors, low, medium, high. You input them into the element three, which is the summary. Down the factor, I, this makes a lot more sense if you have it for me, but I apologize. But just bear with me, it's, it, it had, there's some elements and you have to go through it and then you do, it, do the math. Um, <coughs> and then there's the job hazard analysis. You can do it and you can. You can actually just do it annually and have everybody sign it and you're done for the year. But locally, we've always just signed the GHA for some reason over and over again at every burn, which I still to this day don't understand, but whatever. Um, yeah, my old force we used to just sit down every day, get the whole district together, and just sign every GHA, and then you're good. That can be done. Okay, so but GHA is required uh, appendices, and then there's the fire behavior, fi fire behavior modeling documentation or empirical documentation. It's called. What we almost always do now is a behave run because we all know behave. Behave is easy, but there's nothing in the book in the guide that says you have to do behave. It just says that you have to um, do some sort of fire behavior empirical documentation or fire behavior modeling. Um, but if you do a behavior run, you want to include all the parameters that you have in element four and seven, right, the adjacent, the description of the project area, and the, and the prescription, which is element seven. Um, a lot of times you'll have a low desire and a high fire behavior runs to show it, include runs for adjacent fuels if you're going to do that. Uh, but you can other, use other models. You can use Farsight, you can use FS Pro, you can use that wildfire analyst that Tim Metzger came and demoed. You can use anything that demonstrates a, a modeling or empirical demonstration that under your prescription, the burn plan is going to work out. Hey, did you get your coffee? Susie? I did it. I There's some next door in the main office. Yeah, I'm going to get some things. Sure All right, if you have something. And listen. So, yeah, if you look through there, it's got uh, 
It's not, it doesn't, does not say you just have to do behavior. It just means you have to empirically document your prescription and how that's going to meet the objectives. Cool? All right. Smoke, uh, we, you guys know this from the RX-410 class we've taken it. Uh, we, we're bound as a federal agency to the provisions of the Clean Air Act. Um, so we have to follow the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air Act has been delegated to the states to manage. We have smoke, because of the, uh, California has the California Air Resources Board, which is further divided into local air quality management districts. Uh, we have San Diego County and South Coast. And, and, and Imperial, but that's part of really part of, part of San Diego, um, which basically means down in San Diego County and South Coast, you have to do smoke management plans. It's different. So depending on what air quality basin you're in, you have to know those differences. For instance, South Coast, uh, we had an agreement where you, now you have to enter your burns into PFERS um, as an actual ignition authorization, where in San Diego County, there's really no ignition authorization. You just have to do your smoke management plan once a year and then make sure it's a burn day to go burn. Where South Coast is a lot more stringent, it's because of the, the, the air pollution differences between San Diego County and uh, Riverside, San Bernardino, and LA County. Um, anyway, you get into all this with RX-410, and I don't want to go into it too much, other than that, just remember as a burn boss, you need to make sure that you make sure it's a burn day for one, and make sure you're following your smoke management plan. Um, especially if there's like a smoke receptor or something that you really don't want to impact. Again, uh, like the quarter Madeira burned on my Interstate 8, you really want to make sure, because smoke is the thing that made that be a type 1 burn plan. If it's going to be impacting the freeway, you want to make sure you're looking at those impacts and what your smoke management plan says. Um, I don't need to get into that, and I'm not going to tell you this story. Well, oh, come on. Now, so my old FMO, we had a piece of our district that was in Utah. And uh, most of the district was in Idaho, but part of it was in Utah. And Box Elder County had a local county ordinance that you couldn't burn on Sundays. So <laughs> it's just a pain in the ass. And we wanted to burn on Sunday. And we went and burned on a Sunday, which was by, it was like deer. It turned into, actually, they actually sent out Utah state fire engines to our burn to watch. Like and they had threatened to start putting our burn out uh, because we were in violation of the county permit. Well, my my old FMO mentor and friend, he was a very plucky individual. I learned a lot of things from him. He basically said, "Damn the torpedoes! You don't tell me what to do." On the Forest Service, your county ordinance does not, because again, he knew his policy. He knew his policies. And he knew that they couldn't touch him, but it doesn't make it comfortable. So we went out, we burned, Box Elder was there, county commissioner showed up, they were all kinds of bent about that particular issue. And they issued a warrant for his arrest, which makes it kind of hard when that's part of your district. Uh, you know, when you're a fire management officer of that district. Running from the law. So he stayed in Idaho for about a month until that blew over. But, <laughs> you know, it was one of those things where, like, they threatened to, like, come and get him and this and that. I mean, it, you know, these things happen. These things especially happen in places like that. <laughs> uh, so it was, it was just interesting. You need to know your policies. You need to know your smoke management um, policies. But that was just a little county ordinance. Does the county ordinance, does that apply to the United States Forest Service? Mm. Building those relations, it, right? It's a relationship thing. Yeah. That is where you get into. No, it doesn't, because it count does a state implementation plan. Does a county ordinance supersede a state implementation plan? No. No. Were we following the state implementation plan, which required like 3,500 feet mixing height? Do you think we're really going to go to not burn on a day, because certain people are doing certain things on a certain day? No, we're not going to do that. So. Anyway, that was for it. It was very tense for a little while there. And it was an interesting day out there. Anyway, so that's a cool story. There's more to it, but whatever. So meeting objectives. I always talk about this, and you guys have been hearing this for six months now, and you guys have been hearing it for as long as I've been here, right? Is we want to burn to meet an objective. We want to affect the change on the landscape. There is no, there's no reason to just go light fire for no reason, right? There's no reason. That doesn't make any sense, but you know what I'm saying. We should have objectives that should go after desired changes. How do we know if we met the objectives? 
You know, how many times have you been on a burn? I mean, honestly, how many times have you guys been on a burn and you just dropped the match and it was black and you walked away and you felt good about yourself? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Fast, oh, yeah. Like your whole careers? I know I've done it. I've done it. I'm like, ah, cool, now we lit it. We said, let's go do post browns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you said that, right? Yeah. You should have done the pre and the post. You're kicking yourself. Oh. I mean, I, I go back and forth with the guys on the scans all the time about the Laguna burns. I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, because when I first got there, it's like we'd go out there, it'd be like a cool day, three, four days after rain or whatever. And we we go and they go light the fire, and they're partially pyrolysizing the top needle on the top layer of the fourth floor, and they're burning a few heavies here and there, making some smoke. But I'm like, what did you guys do? What's your objective? I'm not calling them out because believe me, it happens. It happened at Fry Creek. I've seen it in other places. I've seen it all over the nation where we just go out and we just light it and we think it's good. Like, what did we actually do? Why did we come out and exp expend this time, money, and energy to do this? This is what I want you guys to do to take from this class and this experience is after you finish it, you should turn around and <coughs> burn, kick the ash. How far did you burn down into the ash? How many of those heavies that you wanted to burn are still there? If they're still there and you wanted to burn them, you failed. Acknowledge that you failed. Try to learn from it. You know, um, did it burn too hot? You're like, oh god, I shouldn't have done that. that. I've seen that as much too. Like especially that one burn on Laguna, where we burned the piles and we went in later and we did the broadcast and scorched a bunch of trees and we're like, oh god, we shouldn't do that again. You know what? Okay, chalk it up. It's 20 acres that are a little scalded. Uh, it's a lesson. But the trick is to go back and look at what we're doing and then monitor that through time which is a lot easier if you actually spend time on the district or on the forest uh, for more than three or five years at a time or whatever. But, you know, I mean, this is things that you want to do as a professional manager. You want to look at past activities. You want to see what you're doing. And you want, before you invest in all this risk, because people die doing this. This is the other thing. You know, I don't want to be, I'm not Mr. Dramatic about the hero factor of fire, but people do die. I mean, you know, there was a helicopter that went down. Uh, it was a couple years ago down in the south killed like two or three people, mm -hmm. they were doing a prescribed burn. And I asked, my, I wanted to ask them, was like, were they meeting the objectives of the burn at least? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I hate to be like, I don't want to be crass, but you know what I mean? Because like, I would hate to be doing a burn that we were just doing bullshit on and for someone to get whacked by a tree. Because there's no reason to be out there in the first place. If I'm going to get whacked by a tree, for fuck's sake, I want to at least be meeting the objectives of the burn. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I'm serious. I'm 100% serious here. Like, I, if, if it's going to have to go down like that, don't you want to at least be doing something? Right? You ever think about that? You should think about that. I think you should think about that anyway. I'm not sure that's in the 341. But anyway, that's how I feel about it. That's part of the reason why I feel so strongly about it, too. Is that, you know, and that's for any fire or any incident. It's like... There is risk associated with what we do. Wasting taxpayers' dollars is part of the risk. Hurting people, reducing, I mean, all of us that suck in smoke, we're losing minutes off our life. We all know that, right? So when we lose minutes off my life, I want to be doing it for a reason. Uh, maybe that's just me, but hopefully that still that in you guys as well. So just dropping a match and, you know, lighting something that washes away with the first rain, probably not meeting an objective. In order to meet an objective, remember an outcome. You have to change an outcome. You have to affect an outcome. You have to need an actual effect. So. Okay. I don't want to harp on that, but again, this is one of the few things I do want to take away from this class is please try to meet objectives. Don't just go out there and light stuff on fire or cut random trees or brush for no particular reason. Know what you're doing and be able to explain that to the people that are working for you. Okay. So my perfect world vision for RX monitoring, going to prescribe fire monitoring, and this is actually we're making some attempts here. First, very first, and this is what you're talking about, Ace, fire management would be deeply involved in developing the NEPA objectives. That's the left side stuff. Like we would be at the table. We should be helping drive it or at least be part of developing those objectives. All the objectives would be tied to metrics. Metrics are something that we can achieve, we can monitor, we can uh, empirically demonstrate that we've met those objectives or not, which is also fine as long as you learn from that. Um, in my perfect world, we would be having metrics measured at every burn. Whether I don't care if you're just going out and taking photographs like Susie was doing, you know, at least that's something that says, hey, we did this and this is what it looked like. Um, standardized CNF protocol. Does that sound very familiar to one of the groups here? Yeah, one. Yeah, exactly. This is, this is what I'm getting at. This hasn't existed for as long as I've wanted, but I've always wanted it. I want standardized CNF 
uh, burn monitoring. Well, you know, all monitoring, fuels project monitoring, but especially burn monitoring. That's why you guys are doing this. And then uh, the same metrics, standardization will be measured post every burn, you know, day of burn within a year, annually, five years, I don't care what it is, but we would know what it is and we would do it. It's part of the reason why we're trying to build the fuel techs organization because they are a workforce that can help us do it. That's why we've had 53 of you guys, 52 of you guys going through this now. Because I always say, even though you may not be a fuel tech ever in your career, you're still gonna be participating in the fuels program because it's fire, suppression, prevention, and fuels is all part of the program. And you all, at various times, have, have a, a role to fill. Maybe right as you'll start working on your fire effects monitor task book someday, or there for any of you guys, you know? And that's participating in the fuels program, or you'll ask to write a burn plan, or you'll participate, you'll get trained in, in browns like you have been, and you'll go and take some browns transfers. You know what I mean? It all adds up to it. So that's what I would like to see in my perfect world. And this is just an example of some early monitoring we did. We did, you can see there's some metal fence stays, and this is the same metal fence stay right here. We did just <coughs> some burn, we, or we did it, threw it down, then we went out and burned it, we're like, okay, yeah, 100% consumption, we met our objective. Same thing with this bush, you know, it's the same spot, we put it out underneath, you know, the bush remained, which is pretty cool, the shrub, and then, um, you know, good consumption underneath. Just simple monitoring, photo monitoring. So I'd like to say, this is how you write a burn plan. Don't pick up a pencil until you personally know the unit inside and out. I mean, you need to know the unit. I mean, if it's just like a lance, or just like a fuel break, you know, you don't need to spend a week out there. But if it's a big, complicated burn that you can't see all of it from one vantage point, you should probably walk around it a bunch. Uh, you need to really evaluate the fuels, like really know what's out there. Uh, I know I was at disadvantage, like when I was the firing boss on that one unit of week ago where you know I didn't know that there was a heavy concentration of fuel down off the edge because I hadn't had a chance to walk out. You need to go out and walk these units if you can. Uh, it, it, it's a big difference when you're a burn boss or fire boss or holding. See you, Jose. Hey, did you uh, give me your name? Jose. Was that? <laughs> Jose. I'm sorry. I should have known. I just wanted to... My name for my paper? Yeah, for your, uh, for the, for the valedictorian. The post-it. Post oh yeah, I put it in there. I just asked him. Oh yeah. yeah. Right. I was thinking my paper. I'm um, see you, see you now, hopefully. All right, you've evaluated the fuels. You know how you're gonna light it, and you know how you're gonna fight it. So how you're gonna fire it? How you're gonna hold it? Uh, who you want to manage it? You know that can change, but sometimes you know you want to. Maybe I'm gonna give this unit to Jim, and I'm gonna give it to you a year in advance. And this is your unit, you know. And so you, you know, in some, especially smaller organizations, you know, you can you do that. We used to do that. We used to be like, all right, this burn, this one's yours. You write the burn plan. You be the burn boss or you fire it, you know, this is going to be your sign-off unit, it's going to be a good unit. Um, you can do that with folks. Talk to everyone that's going to eat the smoke, which means, you know, get your holders and people that are going to be involved in it, engaged in the burn plan, get them invested in the burn, get them out there walking it. Most of the time, those are the same folks that are prepping the lines and stuff. But so, you know, get them invested. And then make sure your supervisors are on board with it, you know, that everyone is supporting what you're doing because you don't want to be just out freelancing a burn, right? So make sure your FMO, your ranger, your whoever is on board with it. So that's how I think you should write a burn plan. Again, it's just my opinion. Okay, and then just real quick, uh, I always like to say about 75% of your time is with elements 4, 7, the complexity analysis and behavior. That's where the bulk of your time is. Okay, 75%. 20% of it's going to be 9, 11, 15, 16, 17, and 20. 2% of your time <laughs> staring up into space, I forgot about that. A good solid 2% of your time. 3% <laughs> of your time will be everything else, and if you're doing anything different, you're doing it wrong. That is from experience, okay? I'm serious, that's where you should, you should print that slide off and put that next to your first burn meter, right? Um, all right, and then just real quick, uh, I just wanted to mention that for planned presentation, you know, I always like to spend a lot of time writing it. It takes pride in it. So when I, I, me personally, whenever I wrote a burn plan, I always like to make like a nice copy or cover. So this is what I used to do. Like this is what my covers look like on my on my district. Is I would put some pretty pictures together and you know put the name of the burn plan on the top and you know I'd put it in a nice folder and it'd be a nice presentation. Like I worked my ass off on this burn plan. I wanted it to look good. Don't just freaking slap it down on a loose. Where, you know how many stacks of paper do we have in this life? Make, let it be something. Um, make sure you spell check it thoroughly, because otherwise you look like an idiot. That's something. Not an idiot, but I mean, honestly, I've seen a lot of burns that have come, like, 
you, I don't know if you guys have heard any horror stories of people that have got technical reviews through me, but the first thing I do is I just go through and spell check the damn thing or edit it. Uh, and I've actually created a position document about what I want a burn plan to look like before it comes to technical review. I just haven't given it out yet. And a lot of it has to do just with simple formatting. But I'm seeing some really good burns coming through now. Uh, Jamie on the Descanso, she's doing some damn good looking burns. Like, I'm learning some stuff right now. <laughs> it makes me really proud, actually. Uh, package it up. You should have a field copy and an office copy. Make sure someone else looks at it and put a pretty picture on it. Like, these are pictures from, for this Northeast Caches jackpot burn plan. Um, this is the actual the units, right? So this is, I went out and took pictures of the unit. All right, it's pictures. Put it on there. That's what it looked like. Do you have to do it? No. Is it good? Yeah. This is some other burn. This was a one mile canyon burn. This was a sawmill one, which I did not get to. I wrote the burn plan, and then I took another job on San Diego. It was, ended up being a really cool burn. You see a pattern? I always did. I like the yellow and black. It was just my thing. Whatever. <laughs> Roll with it. <laughs> Yeah. I love the fire emboss. I like this is just again, I'm just being an opinion. I love the fire emboss. The fire emboss is the most important person on the burn. The fire emboss will make or break your burn. If you think you have any control over burn as a burn boss, you're mistaken. Your fire emboss does. This is why I like being a fire emboss so much, because you actually get to do something out there. Because once you get, like, all your job as a burn boss is to prep and get it ready. Write the burn plan. Make the notifications, blah, 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 and by the time you get out to the burn, you should just be sitting back and drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes and watching people do work, right? <coughs> See what you're doing. Or chewing or whatever you do. Sitting on a rock. <coughs> but that's what you should be doing. You shouldn't be managing as a burn boss. Sometimes I fail in that. But honestly, and this is why you should engage your firing boss in the burn, because they're the ones who control it and you know they're the ones that make the fire <coughs> on the ground they're the ones that come in the outcome and then your burners to a lesser degree too but most definitely the fire boss should be well engaged with your project especially if you're doing aerial ignition especially if you're doing large-scale missions um, your fire boss is almost as important as the burn boss if not more in some ways so I love the fire boss make sure they understand the plan anybody know who that is? Me. It's not me. <laughs> It looks like a girl. It is a girl. <laughs> okay, so we have a choice. It's a girl. <laughs> I'm the Cleveland. Um, I have a case study I can go through. It takes about an hour to get through. I like the case study, but we can also cut off class right now if you want. I could probably try to get through in about 45. What do you guys want to do? You want to work on your group project? That's fine. Honestly, I don't. I don't care. I, it's really just like it, talking about what's that? I don't know. You want to vote? I mean, I can try to get through it kind of quick. Um, I spent some time. I just want I, you know, I like I want I want some democracy in this. But uh, I, I like to do this as a wrap up because it it talks about like I I thought the way that we approached this burn. The process and we we did some lessons learned on it i thought it was a good example of just what i think proper burn plan preparation and implementation should look like and so that's why i like to share this case study and it's also good because it ends this entire class this whole curriculum with a story so that's kind of nice too okay you guys are good you need a break Go. okay all right let me take a little sip of coffee Get some water. Let's go. All right. So I used to work on the Minidoka Ranger District of the South Sea, and I'm sorry, I hate those people that always talk about their last goddamn forest, but this is what this is from. And the fact of the matter is that since I've been on the Cleveland, I haven't done a whole lot of burn plan writing and stuff. So I learned a lot of stuff on the South Sea. Um, this was called the Mountain View Burn. Um, this is the cover. I didn't do the yellow and black, but I guess it was still yellow and black, just reversed. Um, 2005 NEPA. It was actually kind of a mixed project. It was some wooey defensible space, which, by the way, a few years after I left, a fire went through, and the project that we did saved a bunch of houses. I'd just like to point that out. It actually worked. It's kind of cool when you hear the stories like that. Um, what's that? Winner. Yeah. <laughs> you do this long enough, some of your stuff will actually work. But the objective of the burn, there was a big, like, 650-acre burning, and it was just to reduce fuel buildup um, near a populated area, and it was also near a high-use high wreck complex. 
Uh, so summer 2007, we started. I started doing prescribed fire planning for the Mountain View burn. Um, so a couple years after, we were doing some mechanical stuff before that. We did field verification and operations planning, which is just a fancy way of saying we went out during the summer in between going to fires and we looked at the burn plan. You know, we tried to, or we, I wrote the burn plan. We were trying to figure out how we we're going to do it. Um, some of the planning trips were a little limited because I don't know if you guys remember 2007, but it was extremely busy in the Intermountain West. It had Cascade Complex, a bunch of other fires back then. Um, so it's very busy. Um, the Sawtooth Hotshots did do some late season prep work for me. Um, and then I finally finished up the burn plant package in about, in early winter 2000s. So early winter 2000s. This is what the burn looked like. That's the Mountain View burn. The red unit obviously is it. You have a, a prominent ridge, the Buckskin Ridge, off on the west. You have a major drainage, the Mountain View Creek drainage on this part. And then you have a couple sub drainages that kind of head up to the north here. That just you know you have a couple minor little mesas and plateaus up on the point here, but major ridge line and then major drainage down there. And then you also have this large north facing slope. And this was where a lot of stuff we wanted to burn was, which was you had that encroached conifer into the aspen, and we wanted to try to nuke out the conifer, regenerate the aspen on that north slope. <clears throat> uh, I'm not going to get into this too much, but this is what the actual uh, budget worksheet looked like. I planned it to be, I think, a three days. Uh, first day of black lining, ignition, two days of ignition. I had the hot shots, district staff, engines, and all the people, and it ended up being about $67,000. This is, like I said, I have actually had to break some of this stuff out. Um, and again, this was an aerial ignition burn, too, so we had uh, helicopter costs that are associated with this as well. Uh, PSD burn. So the, when we did the field trips, though, myself, my FMO, the FMO, some of the captains, it led to a, what I call a high level familiarity with the proposed burn area. We really got to know it. There were some trails that went through it. Again, it was a big chunk of ground, like 650 acres or something. Um, so we walked around it. Um, and what we actually did is we ended up coming with some names for certain areas just because um, I, we could have done letters and numbers, but, you know, it was fun. We came up with a name. We had a theme. We ended up doing a Lion King theme at the time. So whatever, it's silly, but it was the Lion King thing. Lion King thing. You ever look at my desk? I still got a little thing of a lion. But it helped us because it, it, it let us give names to areas that we were just walking through over and over again. Um, in 2007, there was a wildfire that was actually located down the canyon because there was a major drainage, a major canyon that this was just kind of located off of. Um, and it actually, I went up as a field observer, and then the burn boss, we knew the burn boss was going to, uh, we knew the guy who was going to be the burn boss was the IC of the fire. So he and I hopped in the helicopter, and we, you know, we mapped the fire, and then we flew up Canyon to go recon the burn unit, which was freaking awesome, actually. If you ever get an opportunity to leverage, you know, helicopter time for something like this, because you're never going to get helicopter time just to go aerially recon or burn unit. You know? So that's what we did. Um, we went and checked it out, so that was cool, took some pictures, and then late summer of that year, um, this is the late summer of the time when I was writing the burn plan, um, we decided to attempt a fall burn. So during the summer, I was writing a burn plan that we were going to attempt in the summer, or into the fall of 2007. Um, and then in the fall of 2000, it says, in this slide it says the burn plan was completed in early winter, but it's really I completed it in the fall of 2007. Uh, and so we wanted to do the fall burn, right? Uh, big broadcast burn makes sense to do it in the fall, right? For what reasons? Cooler, more moisture, so it's a lower intensity. Maybe? That yeah, that could be. Although we actually wanted high intensity in this because we wanted to stimulate the aspens, but you, that is a reason people do burns in the fall. We wanted to use the weather for mop up. Basically, we didn't want it to mop up a 650 acre fire. We just wanted to burn and let winter come in because winters are very long in Idaho, right? So seven month winters. We just wanted to let it burn, and then the snows would come in and take care of it for us. So that's what we decided to do. Um, this is a location map that we created. Uh, same burn unit. We had Jeep Rock out here. We had Jeep Trail Road, Mountain View Road, Buckskin Ridge Road. But then here, this is all trail, and you had to hike this whole part. Um, you had the South Rim. We called this a third saddle beast thicket. Second, we had Pride Rock. That's that's what we like. Too. There were some other things too. Um, first saddle, you know, so we're like first saddle, second saddle, third saddle, you know, you know where you're at. And other people know where you're at too, in case somebody gets hurt or whatever. Um, 
So this is this was really useful for us throughout the length uh, the time of the burn. I'm just trying to reiterate that this is something that's very useful in prescribed burn plan writing. That you actually put some maps with some names on it so people know where you're at. Instead of saying, "Oh, I'm in the northeast section of whatever section," you know, you're like, "I'm at Third Saddle." They know exactly where you're at. So this is the uh, and this is also a topographic map. Okay, so this is that aerial recon from the summer. Uh, I'm looking to the southeast. So looking from, we were flying somewhere over here and looking this way. Um, this was that south rim, so that rim here, and then this is the Buckskin Ridge Road below my feet here, below the helicopter. So again, we were somewhere in here, Buckskin Ridge is below us, and we were in this south rim. This is this prominent rim. It's pretty cool because you come up here, there's a little road that you could park down here and hike up this little piece, and then you could walk across this whole rim, and then down the saddles and all the way down, 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 down. And this is that mountain view uh, drainage right there. Okay, and then see this is all these aspen and, and conifer trees. Here, that's what we really wanted to try to get at. We wanted to try to get rid of a lot of that conifer and, and out in here as well too. And we wanted to light that up. So, our fall 2007 uh, burn attempts. Uh, burn objectives, of course, we wanted to reduce the heavy surface fuels. We wanted to stimulate the aspen regrowth. Uh, that was for the encroached about my frog, sub out my fern left pine. We were monitoring the heck out of it. I mean, honestly, uh, there's not a whole lot to do in October or whenever this was. So, for about a month before, I was going out there repeatedly and checking conditions. Um, twice in that month, we experienced snow and rain. All right, so snow and rain before burn is it can be okay, but not too much, right? And but we're very optimistic, you know, we're like, well, it's just a little bit of snow and there's some pictures, so it was a little bit, but you know, the trees started to leave, so it wasn't too late in the season. Um, and then these leaves would fall, and so it would provide a carrier for the fire. Um, not a big deal. And if you look at it, it's really like this north facing slope caught a lot of the snow, but out here it didn't catch a whole lot uh, of the snow and it melted off pretty quick, so not a big deal. And that's twice in a month, that's not a whole lot of moisture. Again, we, we weren't too diminished by that. Um, I think the burn was like uh, November 5th. I'll, I'll tell you in a minute here, but just to let you know, this was some monitoring that I had done. Uh, starting in late September, you had live fuel moisture grass, sage, and conifer, and then the ones through 1,000 hour fuels. Um, precipitation had occurred, so if you look, check the one hours, you go 10, 9, 20, down to 14, back up to 40, down to 24, 20. And so you have a couple little bumps there in the precipitation. You can really see it in one hour fuels. Uh, the thousands, they reacted a little bit to it, but it was more of an upward trend, and then it kind of stabilized. The thousand hour fuels, eh, you know, that's not really, I mean, we wanted it to burn, but even at 30%, it'll still burn for the most part. Um, let's see. And then 110, so this is the parameters. We have the low and the high parameters. So for one hour fuels, our low and our high was 12 and 8% live fuel moisture, or dead fuel moisture. 20 and 10, 25 and 10, and then for conifer, remember I talked about conifer and live fuel moisture? If you want to get trees to torch out, you need to know what the live fuel moisture of the conifer needles are. <clears throat> and I had told you guys before, about 100 or so, it'll still passively torch. 80 is really when you get into like summertime crowning, and like 120 or 130 is where you really can't get it to torch. So our parameters, our low end was 130 and our high end was 100. So we were on 1026, which I think is the last reading, where were we in our prescription? We were in prescription for conifer, we were in for 1,014, uh, we were in for our tens on the high end, but we were out for, or for one hour fuels. But it's a one hour fuel, right? One hour is going to continue to go down. And then this is a graphic that I used to use, uh, which I actually really liked, for tracking when you're in prescription. It's using this box that you've built, and the black, the black lines is your low end prescription parameter, or your high end actually, and then this other black line is your low end prescription parameter. And it's across 1, 10, and 100 hour fuels. So it's just a way for me to like show my Ranger or my FMO really quickly that we're in prescription or not. So what you can see is that through time, like the fuel moisture went up and went back down. And then on the last day, 1026, which is this one, 10 hour fuels within prescription, 100 hour fuels within prescription because it's in between these two. But one hour, you're up here at like 20. So, but again, I wasn't too worried about that, and this was about a week before, and we weren't getting any more rain. You guys follow that? So that's just kind of a nifty way of uh, showing where you're at with your prescription. And that's just stuff that you punched into Excel and you grab? Yes, perfect. It's just an Excel spreadsheet. 
actually this is the, the spreadsheet and then I just created a graph from this data down here. I think that's why it's, it's multiple. That's how you set it up. It's a pretty nifty way of doing it if you're interested. Yes. I can get it to you or any of you guys. Day of, okay, we, burned, we did um, <coughs> October 29th, uh, 2007. This is the FEMA weather observation. So this is the actual day of burn. So 1218 through 1600, what do we have? Accumulated rain off of Raws. Wind speed's pretty light. Air temperature 59, so it was in the high 50s, mid 50s. Uh, RH was in the 30s, which isn't too bad for there. 10 hour fuel moisture was 10, right? So it was down there. It was actually better. Uh, we had some, it actually had some gusty winds. Um, so it, it, was, it was well within prescription parameters, the burn was. Uh, and this is a video of the first attempt. I have, I should have sound, but I don't think it's there. Actually, sound doesn't matter. So this is an aerial. I was up in the ship. I was actually the fire boss. Dropping the PSDs, and then this is what it looked like. Uh, this is looking pretty much to the north. You can see that prominent. That's the major drainage in the middle. So what are you guys seeing from a fire effect standpoint? What do you think that fire is looking like under there after we drop 10,000 balls? Smoking around dirty. Based, based upon our prescribed fire resource objectives, do you think we're meeting them? Why not? How can you tell? It's too low. We're not killing those conifers with any pressure on that. Why not? Yeah, do you see any of those trees, are all the trees, all the conifers still there? I mean, you can just tell from that light, wispy kind of blue smoke, right? <coughs> so, that's why it's called first attempt. <laughs> so, yeah, it was like flying around. I was like, oh, crap. And this is another one of those instances where I'm in a helicopter right now, right? You just dropped like 10,000 PSD balls for no particular reason. I, I, I think we expected a little something different, but, you know, it is what it is. These are some pictures from it. Uh, this is I took this photograph from the ship, looking straight down. And I'm like, oh look, there's some fire! Fly over there. I want to see that. <laughs> Take a picture of it. But it was just like a little jackpot that was burning underneath the trees, and you know, light wispy smoke. Uh, this was actually a few days later after it snowed. Um, there was still a little little fire valiantly burning in there. Um, this is what we did though. This is um, a little bunkhouse. It was like a church camp or something like that. And we actually set everybody up at the church camp. There was like cabins. They had like wood stoves. It was really pretty bitching. It was awesome. We had a caterer. We like ordered shitters. I mean, it was pretty slick. And, you know, people were there for a couple days. That's how we did that burn. Because it was kind of remote. And we brought people from other districts. Because remember, our district staff was only a couple engines. So we had to bring people from other forests and other districts to come help us. That's Bob Harper. He's our logistics guy. Um... Lessons learned. We dropped over, I mean, I'm serious. We dropped over 10,000 plastic sphere devices in that burn to get that. 10,000 balls had to fly out of the helicopter to get what we got. Uh, we suspected a bad batch of PSDs. The hell attackers kind of mentioned it, but I think that was them just trying to make us feel better. Um, <laughs> I take it. <laughs> yeah, it was obviously the PSDs. Yeah. Uh, I think snowfall, <laughs> the, couple, the snow that we did get a couple weeks prevented the spread from where the devices fell. Because, you know, it just wasn't moving around. But, you know, you, you get little jackpots to burn here and there. What's the lesson learned? And eagerness to burn does not mean it will burn. That was a lesson I had to learn just because I really wanted it to work. And just because it was a really good plan does not mean that it's necessarily going to work out. Logistics were so well done that no one cared. That's, you know, I kind of say that cheekily, but honestly, the logistics were pretty sweet. And everyone was like, well, you know, it's too bad you burned didn't work out, but our little summer camp for two days it was <laughs> awesome. Honestly, it was cool. And, you know, that goes a long way, especially, like, I know we're probably never going to do anything like that here, but taking care of folks that are coming to come and help you goes a long way. And we actually did that same model two or three times later where we, like, set up the camp, fed everybody, bellies are full, hearts are happy. And what did we do? This is the biggest one. Did we go out and drop another 10,000 the next day? No. no. Adaptive management. Don't keep pushing the road. We shut it down after one day. We didn't push that exposure of putting somebody else in the helicopter, the pilot, whoever, you know, and just keeping trying when it's obviously not going to work. That's, you know, if it's not going to work, just knock it off. You know, no reason to keep going. Right? Adaptive management. Okay.
not to be deterred, and as I often say, long Idaho winters, many, many months to think about your past failures. Um, we began site monitoring again in May of 2008, so the following May. And we said, the hell with the fall burn, no one wants to do a fall burn, we're going to make it a spring burn. It obviously should have been a spring burn to begin with. We, we knew that now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we ordered it. It didn't come in time. We could have used it in the fall. So around May 22nd, snow was noted to be present on the site. Uh, May 22nd, there was still snow up there. Some long winters, dude. That's why I love San Diego so much. <laughs> Less than a week later, that snow was off. For the season, we were done off the races. Fuel moisture monitoring, burn prep began. So we're going to try it again. 522, snow to be noted. That's what it looked like. 527, uh, a week later, looked pretty good. Snow was gone. These are the target fuels. This is what we were trying to burn. Like if you were to walk around those stands, the subalpine lodge pole, with aspen, that's what it looked like. Do you see a lot of nasty wood and stuff on the ground there? That's what we were trying to, you know, get at that fuel. Yeah, there's a lot of wood, a lot of dead, and the overstory low-hanging branches. I mean, it shouldn't be too hard to get that to light off, right? Low crown base heights to get a crown fire established, at least past the crown fire. You wouldn't think. It didn't work out for us in the fall. So that's what our target fuels were. Um, by late June, green up had begun, of course. Um, so this is what the site started looking like. Uh, you know, you had all this dead wood, which this is what our target fuels were, right? Remember the fuel model? Our fuel model was still like 10, mostly dead wood. But the concern now was that the site was too green, that we were worried it was, okay, it's too green. I mean, it was straight up jungly out there when we were walking these sites. Because, you know, that late June after the green up, it's, you know, a lot of moisture in the air. So we were worried it was actually going to be too green to spread. Uh, but did we let it deter us? No, oh, of course not. So this is what it looked like June 25th and 6th. Terry was a little jumpy. <laughs> <laughs> so this is that, you're looking at that north facing slope, and then this is that buckskin ridge, so it's looking west. So is there a little different fire effects? You want to see that again? I mean, look at that. We were getting like 40, 50 foot flame legs off PSD. It wasn't coming at us. <laughs> but he was, there was a trail that was down below. I want you to look down in here, which is, this is that uh, third saddle, first saddle ridge, so on the, the south part looking down. This was a stand lodge pole pine that was down in there. Can you see the fire behavior? Yeah, it's wrong. It's not very steep, but I don't know what yeah. to do. Yeah, it's hard to build. Can, can you, can, what are you guys seeing down there? Oh, seeing some candling? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry about the conversation. But, and you can kind of see it at the end there, but yeah, there was a lot of flaming. Mean, you can see the smoke coming out of there, so we were, we were getting in there, definitely, for sure. So yeah, a little different fire behavior. <coughs> and here's some photographs. Here's the drama photographs. <laughs> see what that is? Yeah, that's the A star flying around. Uh, Matt Filbert was a firing boss, and I think he only dropped a couple thousand rounds at the most. I mean, he like he went around, lit it all up, saw a bunch of this, and he's like, "Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Looks good, man. Pretty much hit our target fuels." Yeah, I mean, you look at that. You're getting uh, equal crown height flame heights coming out of that. Uh, you know, getting up into the trees. This is what we wanted. We wanted. Remember how I said in one of the classes that is high intensity, high severity fire bad. Inherently, no. Sometimes it's what you want. Sometimes it's what you need to have. This is what we were trying to achieve. Is this like this is success for us? Um, and speaking of that, we actually made T-shirts for this burn. You always make T-shirts for wildfires. We made T-shirts for this prescribed fire, and this was like the back. Of it. It's all wore off now. Otherwise, maybe I would have wore it. But anyway, it was cool. So the cool thing is that the green up, one of the things we learned is the green up actually served as a barrier to fire spread. So we didn't want to burn the sage anyway. The sage that was out in adjacent in the open areas was a non-target fuel. It was too green to burn anyway, so we could just nuke the crap out of these stands with had the dead fuel component in it, and it just went to town on it. So the green up actually helped us. Uh, we had warmer air temperatures, uh, dry dead fuels. That all helped us create a third dimension fire. Uh, what did we learn about the spring burn? Well, or actually, what are some other things that would cause 
us to succeed in the spring versus in the fall. Is any of your thoughts any other environmental factors? Well, you, I think that I'm not for sure on this, but does the, does the trees suck up moisture? Yeah, I think at that time the, the, the conifer trees weren't really sucking up a lot at the time. It was mostly like the aspens were coming up a little bit and like the herbaceous and the grasses and that. But the conifer life fuel moisture, I don't have the data on here, but <clears throat> it was still like at 100 or so, 110. It was still low. Yep. Well, what I think attributed was longer days, because what are the day lengths in June, June 25th? When's, when's the equinox? June 1st. It's June 22nd. So we're actually four or five days uh, past the longest days of the year. So we had solar increased solar radiation, although it wasn't the warmest. It's, and then, uh, so longer days, I think it's a big part of it, and then warmer air temperatures. And I think that's what contributed to the success, mostly. Um, what do we mean? So there were some consequences to burning in the spring, though, which is long-term monitoring of the burn well into July. Freaking, I can't even tell you how many times the BLM responded to our uh, smoke from the Twin Falls District. I mean, like three, four, or five times they came up trying to put our fire out for us. And eventually we got so goddamn tired of it because we were getting into fire season that we were like, all right, we got we to gotta put this thing out. So we ended up going in and doing like a mile and a half long hose lay, setting up uh, water points, and then like spent three or four days like searching and destroying this one part, like that whole north facing stand. And it was pretty cool actually because <clears throat> we'd like put somebody up on the top of the hill and they'd call like a smoke and then like orient us to it. And we... It was pretty cool because there would be these like nuked out pockets and like the, the stand would be intact and then we'd come across these nuked out pockets and it was just like uh, walking into these like new open glades and like we would like we would just find these little areas and every time we went out we'd find a new little area that had been nuked off. It was just really interesting to see the mosaic um, that had occurred. But it was a problem for us because like we were literally getting wildland fire calls and still dealing with our prescribed burn. That's the downside to doing it in the spring. And, you know, there was certainly the potential for us to have had an incident or for it to escape or whatever. Um, it got to be a pain in the butt. So, and then we did monitoring. That's the other part of this. Is, um, this was a yurt site. Uh, the cross-country skiers like to ski out to this site. Uh, we told them that we would keep this site intact. And, well... <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. You can actually see the, the square where the year we had removed the tent before it. <laughs> but um, yeah, their site got totally nuked out. Yeah, one of those sites with like the 40 foot flame. Because the problem is there was like piles in here and they had gone into the piles and you know, whatever. Cleaner for them now. <laughs> yeah, it's open more open. We ended up moving them around the corner and they were a little pissed for a little while, but the rec guy got on board with it. He's like, listen guys, we'll just move you around the corner and it was fine. Uh, but you know, that's a, that's a fire effect as well, you know, affecting the public and so whatever. Um, then we started doing some post burn monitoring in July. We wanted to see what aspens had come up. So these are one of these nuked off stands. Well, we wanted to see if there was any aspen that was going to come up in here. And a lot of this is aspen. Uh, this is herbaceous stuff as well coming in. And you can see, this is actually this black edge and one of those burned out sites, and then this is where the fire had stopped on its own as it started to get into those open sage and grass areas that we had burned. So like I said, the, the green served as a barrier. It really stayed within the timbered pockets. It was pretty cool. Like we didn't put out that edge. It, we found that edge. Um, this is what that north facing slope looked like afterwards. This is a composite photo. Did you see how we kind of just dropped the balls through this? See all that ash? I mean, we nuked the heck out of it. <laughs> So this point here is this point here, so you can see. Uh, so that's what it looked like in there. So we didn't kill all of those, but we certainly, uh, you know, a lot of this is aspen around it, so we wanted to try to create an opportunity for it to infill, which it did mostly. We didn't go and cut every or kill every tree, but it's hard to do that with fire, right? Fire is kind of a gross tool, so it was surgical. <coughs> so that's what they look like. Factors that led to success. Uh, a definitely an adaptive approach to it, the implementing, and that only means that it didn't work at first, so we tried to identify, A, why it didn't work, and B, how we can make it work the next time. So that was an adaptive approach. We educated everybody that was out on the burn knew what we were doing. They knew what the intent was. There were detailed briefings. Uh, everyone on the district knew exactly what we were trying to produce out there. We should be doing that on our districts here, too. Everyone should know why we're doing it. This is why I always harp on our burn briefings, that you need to 
make sure in your briefing, even if everyone's heard it a million times, tell them why we're doing what we're doing. Why are you out here risking your body? Using the right tool for the job, <coughs> the helicopter that led to some efficiency. <coughs> we also did some hand lighting. And we did an ATV mounted, we had one of those ATV mounted drip torches. Have you ever seen those where it has like a big wand that sticks out? And you can, uh, we use that for some of the areas in the north and it worked pretty well too. We did an extensive pre-burn monitoring when we really got to know the unit. We did a lot of post-burn monitoring. Um, we had actually, speaking of the adaptive management, we had done an earlier burn from 2006 that was similar to this and we brought forward a lot of those prescription parameters and carried that into it so we knew what would help us succeed. And then again, the overhead, everyone that was out there knew every inch of the burn and we all had shared expectations. We all knew what each other expected out of the burn. So, um, so that's, the, that's it in a nutshell. I actually think the RX310 one, is, yeah, now I think about the RX310 version of this is actually longer. And I do some more of the post burn monitoring. So I just wanted to share that just a case study. I mean, just my, my experiences and the be all end all experience, but I happen to think that that was a good case study for. Um, and I wish I had some more updated ones. I just haven't had the time to give more updated case studies. We could probably do some here. Okay, so objectives for this unit. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. I took some Delta. Introduce prescribed fire policy and guidance. I think we did that. Talk about the elements of the burn plan, monitoring to an example burn plan, right? Okay. All right, final thoughts. These are my final thoughts. So, if I have taught you anything in the curriculum, of course, I hope that there's four things that I, hopefully I've taught you for sure. First, Every single one of you guys in this room is, as I've always said, a professional land manager. Okay, it isn't always the people above you, it isn't your ranger, the forester, the resource specialist. It's you. The things that you do every day, except for ag learn, really contribute to land management. You know what I mean? You work for the Forest Service. You don't wear the City of San Diego patch on the side of your shoulder, you wear a United States Forest Service patch on your shoulder, which means that you are a professional, by definition, land manager. And so I don't want you guys to ever forget that, that this is what you do for as long as you work for this agency. I thought we were outcome managers, not land managers. <laughs> well, you also manage outcomes, that's true. That's a good point. <laughs> Through managing the land, you manage outcomes. Very good point. Um, education is a continuing process. Remember what I also said at the beginning of this class? That this class is an awareness class. I'm not going to teach you everything that there is to learn. Uh, I wouldn't even begin to pretend that I know everything as a, your instructor or any of the other instructors. This class was here to just give you an awareness, to give you some tools, to give you some opportunities to you know understand research, know where people are coming from, but it's a continuing process and it's for you to carry forward if you want to. So if you want to learn more about fuels and fire management um, on a you know at this level then you have every tool now that you've taken this class to be able to do that. You know how to get research, you know how to talk to people, you should be able to approach the specialist, um, you, should be able to, you should be able to find those resources. And education is a continuing process and I think what I've seen a lot of the graduates of this class do is to take this data, crunch it down in, and then when you go out on your next fire, your next prescribed burn or whatever as you move throughout the rest of your career, you start to kind of internalize some of the lessons from here and learn new lessons and apply those to your paradigm. Um, so that's what I'm hoping that you take it. Um, is that, you know, continue to educate yourself. Um, knowledge is power, and I know that's kind of cliche, but the more you know, the more you're going to be better at your job. Um, and I'm not just talking about, like, putting this on a resume or whatever. Like, you know, if, if you want to argue with your division supervisor or your ops chief or your crew boss or whoever, if you have the knowledge and the tools and the ability to define why you're arguing it or why you want to do things a certain way, then you know, hopefully some of the things that you've learned in this class will allow you to do that. Um, could be anybody, but remember, knowledge is important. And you have the ability to change things for the better. That's another thing I always try to preach, <coughs> is that I don't care if you're a GS5 or a GS Fantastic, everybody here has the ability to change things for the better. Um, and I believe that to my core. I really, you know, as I say, I don't necessarily expect you guys to go and start kicking a bunch of ass like right away, but I do expect you to have that knowledge and take this and in five, ten years as you guys move into higher levels and affect what you can at your micro scale, but as you advance in your career, start affecting things at a bigger and bigger scale. Um, and don't let anybody tell you that you don't have a say, because if you show up for work in this job, you show up, 
you know, you drag a torch, you hold a tool, you help plan, you help, you know, guide the process, whatever. Every single one of you guys has the ability to, uh, to you know, to, to make things for the better, I guess. So don't let anybody tell you you're just a whatever. You know, you're just a fill in the blank. You're just an engine company. You're just a five, just a whatever. Uh, I don't believe that. I really do believe that all of us have the ability to make a positive change. So. And I think you guys probably got that message by now, right? I, I do believe that. So I hope that you do too. So, all right, that's all I have for you guys. That's the end of the class. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for taking the Cleveland Fuels Leadership Curriculum Class Three. Yeah. Did it? You did it. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you actually failed, so I guess. <laughs> hey, that was bonus points in today. It is bonus points, yeah. This is <coughs> um, so, yeah, I know the rest of it is get to listen to 11 talks tomorrow and then graduation. So, thank you very much. It's been fun. The rest of the time is yours. So, I just want to confirm for some reason I have April 19th down here. That is a, uh, was a scheduled bonus day. Okay, so I'm deleting it. April 19th. I lost my room at the SLA. Dang it, now I gotta go to the BDF Chiefs meeting. Thanks. No. Oh. Sweet. We'll get our